Hello, everyone. Thank you. Bear with me while I get set up. Oh. Okay. Not seen that before. Right. So, hello, everyone. I am Phil Nash, as, as I've been introduced. Uh, some of you may know me as the original author of Catch or the Catch 2 test framework, so I did know a little bit about that. Uh, I was also, until last year, developer advocate at JetBrains, so I could have been giving those coupons away. But it's exactly one year and one day ago I uh, switched over to uh, Sonar. You see the icon up there in the top right corner. And uh, just before this, um, this session tonight, I came in a bit early to give a little presentation to the NetInsight people about the Sonar products, we do uh, static analysis. And uh, speaking for about an hour, now my voice seems to be uh, wearing out a bit. So if my voice does go, uh, you can blame Bjorn because he asked me to, to come in and give that talk. But I will do my best. So this is not your grandparents' C++. Now, this talk is a little bit experimental in a couple of ways. Firstly, I've given it a couple of times before. But both times has been to an audience of mostly people who are either um, not C++ people at all, or maybe they did it sort of a long time ago, perhaps even in the 90s, and the impression of it has been left from, from that time. And they just needed a bit of updating. And certainly the first time I gave it, that was specifically the instruction I was given. There'll be people in the audience that use C++ years ago, they want to be brought up to date. So that was the original purpose of this. And you can see where I got the title from. Obviously, there's a bit of a meme going on there as well, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But the last time I gave it, I was thinking, actually, you know, there's, there's quite a bit in here that would be interesting to people, even if they are using C++ every day. Most of, it, most of this is going to be very familiar to most people, but I'm going to try and put it into a bit more of a historical, evolutionary context. And from sort of some of my opinions about what some of the important points along the way are. And we don't always think about things that way. I think it can be interesting in its own right. And maybe there's, there's one or two things you'll learn technically as well along the way. We'll, we'll see. So who here is currently using C++ in their sort of regular day job on a regular basis? So as expected, most people, but there's a few people that didn't put their hands up. So uh, maybe there'll be a little bit more for you. But of those people who are, well, who, who's been using C++ since before C++ 17? So not quite as many, but still the majority. All right, what about before C++ 14? Similar, maybe one or two less. What about before C++ 11? Okay, a few old hands here. And what about before C++ 98, the very first standard? Oh, a lot fewer. There was a big gap there. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to that. All right, well, let, let's go for, go for gold. Who's been using C++ since before 1992? <laughs> the reason I picked 92, so I think it's just one person, or maybe one and a half, is that's when I started using it. So <laughs> there's one, one, maybe one and a half people that have been using C++ longer than I have. Um, the the, the follow-up question was going to be who was using it in the 80s, but presumed nobody. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't. But it has been around for for longer than that. In fact, as we'll we'll come on to see. All right, that, that gives me an idea of, of who's in the room. What about this title then? I said I'd come back to that. So, let me move that on. I've got a car on here, which seems, might seem a little bit odd. Anybody know what this car is, or at least? Who made it? Any ideas at all? Sorry? Not quite hearing the, re the replies, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, this is a, an Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Of course, you all knew that really. It was made in 1989. Uh, I'm not really a car person. I'd sort of vaguely heard of Oldsmobile before I researched this, but um, didn't really know anything about them. But apparently Oldsmobile were founded in 1897. And they're actually one of the, the arguably the oldest car manufacturer. They were the first to mass produce cars. Now you might be thinking, no, that was Ford, wasn't it? Well, actually, 
Ford were the first to do it on an assembly line. But even before that, automobile were mass producing cars. I'm not quite sure what the difference is, but that's, that's what I've read. So they've got a long history. They go way back. And with that long history, you can imagine you know, they have the, their ups and downs, but they were usually pretty popular. Up until around the late 70s, early 80s, they seemed to sort of lose that popularity a bit. And they started to get the sort of feeling of, you know, a bit of an older person's car, maybe. So to try and reinvigorate their market, they came out with this actually fairly clever advertising campaign. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. So the idea being, well, you know, maybe, maybe you've seen those older cars that we did. No, this is something different. This is going to appeal to the younger generation. And there was actually a, a series of uh, quite amusing TV ads as well. You can look them up on, on YouTube. They did a really good job of this marketing campaign. Unfortunately, it backfired. And the reason is the car itself wasn't actually that much different. It was just a repackaging of the same old thing. It was just a marketing spin. And of course, you know, people cottoned onto this pretty quickly and thought, well, you know, it's, it's a bit of a joke, really, this, this uh, marketing slogan. And that's one of the reasons it's now become a bit of a, a meme today. You know, it's not your father's something. Or if you want to add an extra generation in there, not your grandfather's something. So that was what I was thinking of when I came up with the name for this talk. In fact, when I first proposed it, I said, not your grandfather's C++. And I thought, maybe that's a bit unnecessarily sexist. So I, <laughs> I changed it to grandparents. But, but there's, there's the heritage. There's the, uh, the whole advert, by the way. Now, why am I telling you all this? So what's the relation to C++? Well, now I've told you a little bit about the history of the car and the manufacturer. Maybe you can spot some parallels to C++ as a language. It's had a long history. It's gone through some ups and downs, but been pretty popular. But there was a period where it started to wane in popularity. And it seemed like nothing new was, was coming along. It seemed like an older person's language, perhaps. And maybe there was an Oldsmobile moment where they, we had to do something as a community to reinvigorate interest in the language. And one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, did we have that moment? What happened? Uh, what's the situation today? And we'll, we'll get to that question, hopefully, if I time it right, uh, at, at the point of the first break. So let's start right back at the beginning when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Well, not literally, but just uh, metaphorically at least. So a little brief prehistory of C++, the historical context that it was born into. Again, a lot of this will be familiar, but maybe some of the details uh, you may not have known. But we can trace it all back to 1957, the Algol language was really the, the first language that sort of looks somewhat familiar as a modern programming language. There were other languages before which were much more specialized, but Algol was really this, this first sort of general programming language that had a lot of the same sort of features that we still have today. 1962, we have uh, Simula. It sits off to the side there because it follows a slightly different lineage. But actually Simula, the original Simula, was a strict superset of Algol. In fact, originally it was just a, a front end for, for Algol. Then later it sort of branched off into its own, um, its own fork. But yeah, so just the object-oriented um, features on top of Algol, uh, strictly speaking. But on the non-OO side, we continue the lineage down 1963 CPL, 1967 BCPL. And these are all um, you know, pretty much one inheriting from the other. 69B until finally 1972, we get the C language. Now, of course, C is still around and popular today. We don't tend to see much of CPL, BCPL, or B. So why, why do we even put them in here? Why are they important? Well, sometime in the 70s, a certain Bjarne Straustrup was doing his PhD thesis, and he was using two languages, BCPL and Simula, for, you know, for two different things. And what he found was that Simula had all the high-level abstractions that he really wanted. He really liked it as a language, but it didn't perform very well. It wasn't really a systems language, even though it had its roots in Algol. Whereas BCPL was much closer to the metal. Uh, it didn't have any, any problems with that, but it was just much harder to work with, a bit too low-level. 
So he really wanted something that had the best of both worlds. And that really was the, the initial motivation for coming up with a new language that combined the strengths of those two branches, BCPL and, and Simula in, in his case. And it was a little bit later that he then came up with that language, originally called C with classes, now really based on C rather than BCPL. And again, taking the OO stuff from Simula. But what I wanted to emphasize here is that, that aspect of um, no compromise. We want the low level access and the high level abstractions without trading anything off. That was, that's what, what he was aiming for. And of course, in the, the 80s, finally got a name, proper name, C++, as we know today. But 1985 was when it first came known as C++, but really it started in 1979. So, yeah, who here was using it in 1979? So, let's go back to what we were just saying. What, we were talking about zero cost abstractions. That, that's really what that insight that, uh, that Bjarne had back then, combining those two languages. And closely related to that, or sometimes sort of a, an application of it, or a secondary effect, don't pay for what you don't use. So it's okay to have a, other abstractions that do have a cost, but you should only pay for them if you use them. Those two things really go nicely together. You can see now how that was right at the heart of C++, or even before that, right from the very beginning. So that's the prehistory. Let's now just move a little bit further forward in time to the first standard version of C++. It wasn't standardized until 1998, very first C++ standard. And as we'll mention a bit in a minute, we sometimes today talk about C++ 98 slash 03 as if it's a single language, mostly because 03 didn't really add much in the way of, or anything really in the way of features. You can think of it more as a bug fix release. So these days, we're really talking about C++ 03, but started with 98. There was a lot different in C++ 98 to the original C with classes that then became C++ through the 80s. But before we get to that, let's go back a little bit and talk about some of the things that C++ as a language introduced to the systems programming world. Classes, of course, may be the first thing that, that comes to mind. It was right in the, the original names, C with classes, as a way of doing object-oriented abstractions. That it obviously borrowed from Simula, with a few changes. But actually, if you look back at Simula, a lot of the syntax is very, very similar. You can see it directly borrowed across. Along with that, but in separate features, inheritance. You don't have to be able to do inheritance to use classes, but back in the day, they sort of went hand in hand. Again, closely related, polymorphism. So being able to treat different instances um, as if they have a, a, a sort of common subset one way or another. And encapsulation, being able to hide access or uh, restrict access to certain parts of your classes so that, well, there's various reasons you do that. This is not a talk about that. Just wanted to sketch in the flavor of the most important features of the original version of C++. But then there was more that particularly came in through the 90s. Uh, templates, maybe the big one. Um, but even inline functions which is one thing that really separated it from C, uh, relying less on the preprocessor to do things. And overloaded functions. You know, things that we take for granted now were all introduced in maybe the late 80s, early 90s. Now, really bringing C++ 98 into it. The big thing that came in C++ 98 was the STL, the Standard Template Library. Obviously, relied on templates being fully formed at that point. Again, we take it for granted now. It's such an, an idiomatic part of the language that we forget it only really came about in 1998. So those of you that had your hand up to say you were using C++ before 98, remember what it was like and what that transition was like. It was like, this is a new language. <laughs> it really was transformative. It changed the way you thought about things. Uh, we'll dig into the STL a little bit more as we go through. But I want to mention one other thing, which often gets lost in the mix here, which I think is really pivotal to a lot of the complexity of C++, 
is its use of what we call references. Now, when I was preparing this material for a largely non-C++ audience, I took a little bit more time to explain what we mean by references, because it's a bit different to what most other people <laughs> mean. When we talk about reference semantics, we're talking in general about things that refer to other things. Um, in C++, we have two ways to do that, one of which we call references. So it gets a bit confusing when you're talking cross, cross language. But again, this is really basic and fundamental, but I want to step through this just to show you where I'm going with it. So in C++, of course, we, we have value types, uh, primitives like integers. Of course, you can create your own types. But while we call them value types, the value is really that, that 42 there in this case. Whereas I, we can think of it as a name for value, but in practice, it's what we call an object. You don't have to have a class to have an object. An object is just a location in memory that has a certain meaning. So even that integer, it's somewhere in memory. And that means that you can get, for example, a pointer to it. So now we have a pointer to that particular integer. So if we now change i to a different value, p points to the new value and the other way around. We know this. And of course, we can also take a reference to that integer, mostly with the same properties that I just described. So why do we have two mechanisms in the language that do sort of the same thing? Of course, partly that's historical. C already had pointers. We wanted to do better. Quite late in the day, really, Biana introduced references. So some we often say that uh, the, this pointer in a class, it should really have been a reference, but when we invented this pointer, we didn't have references yet. It actually came later than we think. But what's the advantage in a references? We put it in a table, and you see the differences. So both pointers and references, well, you can initialize them to a value. Of course, we just saw that. They're assignable in the sense that if you assign a value to them, it writes through to the original variable. Whereas only pointers are rebindable. You can point them to a different object, a different memory address. Pointers also have a different syntax. You have to either dereference or use the arrow syntax. Whereas references, they look just like other values. Pointers are actually just an address. It's what they point to that we're interested in. But we can actually get the address itself. There is an address behind references, but it's hidden. And only pointers are nullable. So if you don't want them to point to anything at all, you can point them at null. Now what's interesting is that all of those things that look like an advantage for pointers, that's mostly where the problems are. <laughs> it's usually where we get into trouble. So really, if we can get away with just the first two, we should always be using references. Only reach for pointers if you need the other things. Again, this basic stuff, but sometimes it's worth reminding ourselves of those basics and where they're really coming from. So we can also um, introduce the const keyword. And const can be applied at different levels. So this, uh, the second line here, const int star, it's a pointer to a constant int. But we can also apply the const to the pointer. So it's a constant pointer to a non-constant. And we could combine the two. So we've got a constant pointer to a constant int. Now, I know some of you are thinking, why, why are you putting the const on the left-hand side? Uh, so who here identifies themselves as East const? Ooh, not, not, not many. Uh, there's a few, a few people finally admitting it. Um, I've got a slide for you in a moment. <laughs> but it does look a bit confusing. And even as experienced C++ developers, as most of us are, it can be hard to follow this sometimes. But this is what we've got with, with pointers. Now, well, in fact, I've put the extra slide in here. So the top level const, the one that applies to the value itself, or the value type, like the first one, constant, that const can go before or after the type. So we can also do that. So this is, this is what we mean by east const. So when it's to the right or to the east of the type it applies to, you've got a catchy name a couple of years ago. Why, why would you do that? It seems to be non-idiomatic. Well, actually, 
If you, if you look, can you see that we've got this sort of inconsistency, like zigzagging where the int is if you go down, but when you put the int first, it's always in the same place. Well, that, that's the first thing, but more importantly, now, take the bottom one, for example, we can read it right to left. It's a const pointer to a const int. Doesn't really work this way around. Now, this is not a talk about is const, so I'm not going to go any further. I will say that I do have some is const wristbands if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> Come and get them afterwards. All right, really this is just to, just to remind us you know, how complex this stuff really gets, just dealing with, with pointers. Now, references, this is the story. The, implicit, the reference itself is implicitly const. You can't rebind, so you can't change it to reference to something else. So we don't have to worry about that case. We've got a mutable reference and a const reference, and that's it. Obviously, you can have references to pointers and so on, but then we're bringing pointers back in. And that's really at the heart of it. The, the restrictions, if you like, on references actually open up simplicity and certain guarantees. You know, while you can have a reference ending up pointed to something that's null. That shouldn't happen. That's a bug. So you never have to do null checks. You don't have to worry about things changing. There's lots of guarantees you get from using references. So that, that's really what these missing parts actually give us. And just to put that in, in pictures, well, if you've got a value, you can have a pointer to it, or you can have a reference to it. Either the pointer or the reference could be const. Sorry, the pointer or the value can be const. Reference is always const. Then we mentioned values. You can deal with just values without worrying about pointers or references, and there's certain advantages to doing that. Mostly, you don't have to worry about all the complexity of what we just talked about. And we tend to call that way of approaching things value semantics uh, or value oriented programming. And C gives us a number of ways to make this um, easier. In particular, unlike many other languages, there's no distinction in the type between what, say, a value type or something that's meant to be um, used with reference semantics. Like, for example, in, in C Sharp, a class is always a reference type and a struct is always a value type. No, anything could be a value type or a reference type. But C++ gives you a number of other things on top of that that make working with value types even more powerful. And perhaps the most powerful of all is what we call RAII, which is a bit unfortunate <laughs> that we call it that, but it's stuck. And just as a reminder, it stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. But really, it's, it's just about destructors. <laughs> and again, just to put that in an example, I'm not going to labor it too much because I know we're familiar with this, but um, you can have a constructor and a destructor, and they are very strictly scoped. So if we have some code like this, then the destructor for SR2 here will get called exactly at the point that we hit the, that closing curly brace. Again, fundamental stuff if we're an experienced C++ programmer. So much so that we forget that most other languages don't have this. Deterministic destruction is almost completely unique to C++. I think there's one or two other less mainstream languages that may have it. And some other languages have other features that try to approximate it but they don't quite get all the way. The guarantees this gives you when you're managing other resources are um, things that we take for granted and other languages have to have workarounds to achieve. Or just to illustrate this, again, I won't dwell on it too much because I think we're familiar with it, but we, we can precisely predict when those things are going to happen and that's fairly unique. Okay. As a consequence of that, we have these higher level types that we can build in the libraries, like, like vector. Managing a dynamic array in C is where we get the, um, this sort of image of it all being about manual memory management and that being very tricky to manage. We don't generally worry about that in C++ because we have types like vector that will manage our memory for us. And of course, we can write our own memory managing memory managing types. But let's have a look at vector. And let's just work for a little example. So vector is a dynamic array, as we said. So we can declare one like this. It's going to be empty. How do we get stuff in it? Of course, we know we can, we can push back a value. 
If we want to push a load of values on, well, we've got to do a load of pushbacks. In C++ 98, remember that's where we are at the moment, it's pretty much the only way to do it. There's, there's one constructor where you can just put a load of the same value at once. Um, but other than that, you're pushing back or using something on top of that. Well, that gets a bit tedious. The other thing is, when we create the vector there, it's got a, maybe a small pool of memory in it. And at some point, probably on the pushback two, maybe in the, first, the, the second one, that's not going to be enough. So it has to allocate some more, usually doubles each time. So here, you've probably, you've probably got about three memory allocations. So of course, you, know, you can reserve something up front if you know how, how big it's going to be. And you know, we, we told ourselves, well, this is the cost of um, that low-level access. You know, now we've got very fine control over when memory allocations happen and, and so on. But it's tedious. Let's push this a bit further. Let's introduce another vector, this time of strings. And what we want to do is convert all of the integers into strings and store them in the second vector. Should be straightforward. First thing we need to do, well, first of all, after declaring the vector, we know what the size is now, so we can, we can reserve that. We've got to um, iterate over all of the elements in the original vector. C++ 98, so we'll be using iterators. Got begin and end. Now, we still use iterators, of course. Starting to change in C++ 20, we'll get onto that later, but yeah, we're, we're familiar with that, how these work. But before C++ 98, this was a, a pretty alien concept. We would be indexing or maybe using pointers. And actually, iterators are modeled after pointers. But iterators really changed the game. Now, what, when we talk about generic programming, we often think of templates. We've got the standard template library. All of the containers are templated. They're generic types, after all. But actually, when we talk about C++ being a generic programming language, we mostly talk about iterators. Because they abstracted not just the types, but the shape of the containers as well. With iterators, we can be agnostic most of the time to what type of container we're using, as long as it implements the iterator interface. We can write algorithms completely separately to, to those, and they will mostly just work. Obviously, there's, there's some differences, iterator categories, we're not going to get into that too much. So yes, yeah, it's hard to overstate how much of a game changer iterators were when they came out in C++ 98. But again, using them turned out to be a bit tedious. So we probably need to store them in some intermediate variables. Like, let's capture the begin and end into two iterators. If we're not going to be changing what the iterator points to, we probably need a const iterator. Again, it's modeling a pointer, but we can't actually put that in the syntax that it's a const <coughs> iterator, so we have to spell it out. That means we've got these really long type names. No type inference in C++ 98, so we have to spell it out all the time. And then we can actually do our loop. Now, of course, you can write those in the, the head of the loop, but because it's so verbose, <laughs> Usually we had to separate it out just so they could read it, unless you were really careful with the formatting. So yeah, very often we'd write it like this. OK, so we're iterating over our integers. Now we want to convert the integers into strings. Well, one way to do it, which was somewhat idiomatic, if not particularly efficient, is just to use a string string. I won't go into this too much. I'm sure you're familiar with string strings. But yeah, we can, we can string that integer in. And then we can do dot str on it to get the string out. Straightforward stuff. As I say, there's, there's quite a setup cost in constructing it. So there's, there were various workarounds if you really cared about the performance of this. But this was readily understood. We'll, we'll go with it. So OK, we've got all of our integers converted to strings and put into our second vector. Great. Now, just to show you that we can still use indexes, we'll iterate over that using an integer index. Um, and this is the output we get, as, as expected. Obviously, you can't really tell that they're <laughs> strings at this point, but we know that they are. 
okay, well, there, there's all the code that we've ended up with. That's a lot of code for such a simple task. Just for fun, I thought I'd do the same thing in, in Python. <laughs> the, the code for the complete example in Python is less than the code for our final loop in C++, 98. So, yeah, again, we, we, we told ourselves, well, this is just the cost of being able to be low level. But remember, Bjarne's original motivation was, yeah, he wanted the high level abstractions as well. He wanted to have his cake and eat it. But we weren't quite there yet, at least back then. So, okay. Um, we'll switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna come back to this, but I wanna just talk for a moment about classes. So we said that you know, classes have been around since the early days of C++. Uh, again, we're all familiar with this, I'm sure, but because this is, this is the class that has two members, a string as a name, and then a vector that we're going to call data. But then we had to add a constructor in order to get the values in, so we can construct it in one hit, which meant repeating. We've got a string and a vector, and then repeating the names again <laughs> to, to copy them in. And there's lots of copies involved, even if we're using the const refs. And then maybe we want to add some accessors. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of code here, again, to achieve very little, but that's, that's what we had, and still largely have today. Okay, let's use this. So we're gonna need some data to put in, so we'll create a vector, we have to use pushback to get some data in. And now we'll construct one of those classes, passing the string and the data. Okay, so far so good. So this is now a value type. If this is in a function, it's gonna be a local variable on the stack. Uh, it could be part of another class, of course. Um, okay, now if we wanna call one of those accessors, say the, the name member, we can do that with the dot syntax we're all familiar with. Great, all right. But very often we create classes because we want to use reference semantics. And to do that, we need to allocate the instance on the heap. So we can use the new keyword, which will allocate on the heap and invoke the constructor. And then we get a pointer. And as we said, pointers have different syntax. So we have to use the arrow to get to name instead of the dot. At least this was pre-standard C++ way of doing it. And that means now we've got this object on the heap. We have to do our manual memory management. So we're gonna to have to delete it at some point. And that's a bit that's easy to forget. So, C++ 98 introduced auto pointer. Now there have been smart pointers around before um, C++ is auto pointer, uh, but this was the first smart pointer in the standard. And the first look, it seemed to solve the problem. Now we can create on the heap, store it in the auto pointer, got the same syntax to get to name, but now we don't have to delete it because that's happening in the destructor with the auto pointer. So we've effectively applied some of the value semantics to, to a pointer, okay? But then, it, then things get weird. <laughs> if we want to um, assign that auto pointer to another auto pointer, well, what happens? Who owns the, the memory now? Well, even if you weren't around uh, back in the day, you probably know how auto pointer works. It actually destructively mutates um, the thing it's assigning from. So after this line, obj there will be not pointing anything anymore. Um, it's transferred the ownership to obj2, which was a really nice thing to be able to do, very valuable, this uh, unique ownership property, and very often what we want, but also a bit surprising and didn't really follow the, the C++ semantics properly, to the point that you couldn't actually use them in the standard containers, because they would just lose what they were pointing to. This wasn't set up to handle that. So if you tried to put one of these into a std vector, for example, it wouldn't even compile. They had to put some tricks in to stop it compiling because it was so dangerous. So we managed to put a feature into the standard library that was so dangerous we couldn't use it with other parts of the standard library. 
Think about that for a moment. But the idea was good. <laughs> so we'll come back to that. So there's plenty more we could say about C++ 98. I've tried to just sketch out some of the things we had to deal with, jog our memories a bit, if we hadn't coded that way for a while or at all, maybe. Um, you see it's slightly moving. I mentioned C++ 03 uh, that came and went. Actually, going back to Vector, um, who remembers what changed about stood Vector in C++ 03? <laughs> Harold. Um, the standard required that it's implemented as continuous memory in Vector. Yeah, so before C++ 03, in the original C++ 98, Vector was not required to be contiguous in memory, or the, the buffer that it pointed to. All the compilers, or the mainstream ones at least, implemented it that way. It turned out to be really useful to rely on it that way, of course. So O3 fixed that. That was one of the biggest changes in O3. There's a few others, but there's maybe the most impactful one. Um, is that actually moving? Maybe I didn't start my animation. OK, now it's moving, right. <laughs> so 98 was around for a while. O3 uh, came and went, and there was a lot of talk about the next upcoming standard, and what was going to be in it. It's going to be a big release. And we talked about C++ OX, because we didn't know what year it was going to be coming in, just it was going to be sometime in the next few years. So C++ OX. Um, new smart pointers, all sorts of things. But maybe one of, the, one of the biggest features that we were promised, we're really looking forward to, was concepts. <laughs> and we kept hearing about how great this was going to be. And so we didn't mind that it kept delaying and delaying. Actually, we did mind, but what could we do? Um, and actually, <laughs> we started to get to the end of the 2000s, and we just still didn't have C++ OX. So for a while, we joked, actually, it was hex. And we had another six years yet. But then, just for a, for a brief time, we, we started talking about C++ 1x. We started to get uh, a bit real. Um, but it was only a brief time, because then suddenly, C++ 11 was here. And C++ 11, well, OK, it didn't have concepts. One of the reasons that um, the pre the, this standard delayed so long was because Concepts wasn't really ready. And eventually we realized we couldn't fix it in time. We had to take it out. And unfortunately, a lot of the standard library had now come to be re-specified in terms of concepts. And that all had to be undone as well. So just taking it out took time. So we eventually got C++ 11 without concepts. A little bit disappointing, but also turned out to have a lot of big new features. But at this point, yeah, 13 years had elapsed since C++ 98. So if we ignore 03, it didn't really add any new features. People had got used to C++ just being the same. And it was getting a bit old. Other languages had surpassed it in many ways. Was it even relevant anymore? Is it too late? Was it enough to change things? Well. This was the point that I was going to say we should take a break, but I got here faster than I expected because I skipped some bits. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll tackle this question before the break instead. So a few things happened in the meantime. So first of all, Moore's Law basically started to dry up, at least for single core, um, well, single cores. So up until that point, Moore's Law was predicting that um, the number of transistors on a, on a chip would double every two or three years. I forget the exact frequency, but we were pretty strictly on that curve for, a, for decades, really. 18 months, I think. 18 months, OK, thank you. But sometime in the mid, early 2000s, that started to slow down, actually quite, quite sharply. And before that point, but particularly through the 90s, if you were developing in the 90s, especially on C++, you probably used to hear a lot that we shouldn't worry too much about performance because next year the process will be twice as fast. <laughs> so, yeah, spend your time on developer productivity. And that's why languages like Java and C Sharp really became popular because 
I mean, they're actually quite performant themselves these days, but back then, there was a big performance cost to using those languages, but it didn't matter because processors were getting faster at a, at a bigger rate. But with Moore's Law slowing down, there was a refocusing back on low-level performance. Suddenly it became a bit more important again because our ambitions were still growing, the systems we're building were still bigger, and we needed to be more productive. So it seemed to be a bit of an impossible matrix, really. But yeah, there was a refocusing on performance. But also, we realized that actually we needed to be able to more easily make our code more parallel. So we could take advantage of multiple cores, because that seemed to be the next step. And as we've seen how it's played out, that's mostly been the case. Maybe not quite as, as much as we thought, but that was another problem for C++. 98 it didn't actually have a threading model at all. <laughs> uh, doing multi-threading in C++ was possible using third-party libraries, but it was basically undefined behavior. It just worked um, in most cases, but not part of the standard at all. C++ 11, we got a, um, a threading memory model and some basic primitives. We still needed some high level stuff to really take advantage of uh, parallel processing. And we'll, we'll see later how we're actually still working towards that, but that was the start of it. So yeah, we, we got the, the basics of threading, refocusing on low level performance. And then the, the big thing was all these languages that had surpassed it had all these nice new modern features and C++ was a bit left behind in that syntax we just looked at. But it got a load of features that cleaned up enough of that, not all of it, but enough of it that it actually made working with it much more productive. So well, it was around, around this time that uh, Herb Sutter wrote an article. Uh, some of you may remember uh, the free lunch is over, talking about Moore's Law finishing and the, the need to move to parallel and why C++ should be a, a big part of that. Um, turned out that you know, that really was sort of capturing the mood at the time and a, a, a pivotal point. Now, it took a, a few years, I'd say maybe even into the C++14 era, but not only did we get renewed interest and, and people coming back to C++, but a whole new generation of C++ developers who rather than being attracted to other languages came straight to C++. And so I would say that we avoided our Oldsmobile moment. We did actually manage to appeal to a new generation. We pulled it off. And now we're, we're moving on from that. So let's have a look at some C++11 stuff. So we looked at this example earlier in the context of C++98. Remember, we're just filling a vector with integers and then converting those to strings and stuffing them in another, vect another vector. A load of code. We looked at the Python comparison. All right, let's take this a bit at a time. All those pushbacks we had to do, and even the reserve, very tedious. And of course, C++11 gave us initializer lists. But we could do that in one line, pretty much just like in Python. Slightly different syntax. OK, great start. Now, what about this bit? This was the really messy bit. First of all, we, we, we found those iterators really tedious to work with. Iterators are great in concept, but just such a pain to use in practice. So of course, we've got type deduction. Clean up a load of that. We can use auto now, because we don't really need to worry about that type. It's not really giving us much information uh, for, the, for the iterator. Now, some actually took this further. And uh, who here identifies as almost always auto? No. I think more than these constants, actually. Yeah, I, I'm one of them as well. So the idea is, yeah, use const wherever you can unless that type would really convey useful information. Turns out to be maybe less than you, you think. Or maybe I just haven't looked at my old code recently. But yeah, that, that cleaned up a lot. So that's, that's a good start. But it's still basically the same. So. Actually, I would say that, that cleaned it up enough. We can now move the <laughs> iterator initialization into the, um, the head of the for loop. So that's, that's good. What about our conversion to string? Well, then we have stood to string, which is still not 
the most performant way to do it. If that matters to you, you might still roll your own. But just as a go-to, this is so much nicer than the, the old string string way. So that's nice as well. But of course, you're all thinking, what about the range-based for loop? We don't even need to specify the iterators at all. We could just let the compiler do that for us. We just want each integer in, in the, the vector. Great. This is starting to look a lot nicer. Of course, some of you are thinking, no, no that's, that's not far enough. Really, we, we should use algorithms. And of course, we could have done this in C++ 98. We had stood transform. We got, we're back with our iterators. This would have been the better way to do it to start with. But you notice I've left a little bit here unspecified. Reason is, before C++ 11, we probably would have had to do something like this. Now, OK, yeah, we could have done it with a function pointer as well, but bear with me. So with these algorithms that take something to be executed on each iteration, we can supply it, say, a function pointer or a function-like object, function object, which is basically any class or struct that has a call operator. So we'll write code like this. So that, that's just calling on two, just a string. Uh, in fact, we probably could have just passed a pointer just a string, just two, two string. Um, no, you can't, um, because that means taking the address. Yes, no, you're, you're right. You shouldn't take an address of a standard function because the, the signature is, is not stable or it may be overloads. I've kind of stuck with that. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so we would need to wrap it anyway. But yeah, this was, we, we did this a lot back in C++ 98. We forget sometimes. <laughs> of course, in C++ 11, we've got lambdas. Now we can write the same thing in line. And when I say the same thing, I'm not just saying that to, to brush it to one side. That lambda is actually isomorphic to the function object to the point that that's even how it's specified in the standard, that it is isomorphic, which is a really useful way of thinking about it. If you're not quite sure about lifetimes or where things are stored, just think, well, if I unroll this as a, as a functional object, what would it look like? And for just a, a simple lambda with no captures, it really is just a wrapper around a function. But of course, we can capture variables in a lambda we put in the square brackets, of course. And that is really like a call to a constructor on a function object that will then store it in a member that you have access to in the body of the lambda. Uh, and again, that's exactly how it's specified. So it can be useful to think of it that way. And of course, a lot of the complexity of working with lambdas, again, comes back to references in the language. We have to distinguish between things that we're capturing by value or by reference, or in some case, uh, values that are pointers. The biggest one, of course, being capturing the this pointer accidentally, the bane of working with lambdas. But the point is, again, we have very fine control. And as long as you avoid some of those pitfalls, it's a much nicer way of working. So lambdas were one of the biggest features of C++11. Um, oh, there's an example of capturing by reference. And by the way, of course, I've specified what I'm capturing here, um, whether it's by value or by reference. We can capture everything by value or by reference with a shorthand syntax, but that's what puts you in danger of or capturing things you hadn't intended to, especially that this pointer. Because if you think you're capturing a, a, a member variable, and it works, it's because you're capturing the this pointer and you may have a lifetime issue there. So it's something to, to watch for. Let's go back to this example with the, the auto pointer, the 9803 way of doing things. And of course, C++11, that was deprecated. No surprise, given how dangerous it was, as we said. And of course, it was replaced by unique pointer. Now, what made it possible to replace it with a unique pointer is move semantics, R-value references. 
which we're not going to dig too deep into. Again, big topic that I'm sure you're mostly familiar with, but allowed you to specify an overload for the thing that can move or transfer ownership rather than uh, taking a, a destructive copy. So unique pointer worked exactly as auto pointer was meant to have worked if we'd had that facility to start with. So there's no reason to use auto pointer after that point in any new code at all. And in fact, it was removed from C++ 17. And there's very few things that are ever completely removed from C++. I think I looked it up, there's like a little page full over the, the history of C++. One of them is auto pointer. Again, that, that tells you a lot about how dangerous it was. Now that means that if we do try to disuse an assignment like this, like we did with auto pointer, which would have compiled, that doesn't compile with unique pointer because in fact it tells you, at least my compiler did, call to implicitly deleted copy constructor. No copy constructor on unique pointer. Instead, we have to use std move. What does std move do? It does not move. <laughs> std move just basically converts what you pass to it into an R value reference that will then invoke the correct overload of the unique pointer, in this case, constructor. And that's what will do the, the transfer of ownership, the constructor on unique pointer. Um, thought I had something else to say on that, but maybe not. So I'm glossing over a lot here. I know it's a big topic, but I'm assuming most people are familiar with it anyway. More to show you how we're moving forwards. Oh yeah, here we go. I did have something else. So this is what it looks like on the other side. So if we're defining our own type with a uh, move constructor in this case, well, we usually have to move the individual members as well. Um, I'm not sure what that, oh yeah. And we can use std move for um, copy constructors or sorry, normal constructors as well. And instead of using constref, you see the constref on the string and the, the vector, we take those by value and then move them in. That actually means that you can, um, you can pass temporaries in that don't construct new types along the way. And I think that's, yeah, all I'd say about loose semantics for now. So this is some of the things we've looked at with C++ 11. There's plenty more that we haven't covered. We haven't touched on variadic templates, uh, perfect forwarding, context pro. <laughs> so we'll say a little bit about that. Because again, we're probably familiar with context pro, but maybe we forget how limited it was in C++ 11. I had to look it up myself. No variables no loops, and in practice, no if statements. I think they were technically allowed, but there's nothing you could really do with them without uh, variables or uh, multiple return statements. So really it's just single line expressions that always return the value. So very limited, but we didn't have them at all before, so it was a big step forward. So uh, yeah, just to sketch it in, um, this allowed you to write functions that could be executed at compile time. Didn't have to be. And we'll see how that progresses in future versions as we get to that. So that's a big list already, but there's plenty more. And this is not complete. Uh, we mentioned the Fred Aware memory model already, but it was a huge release. So many of these things we use every day uh, today, introduced in C++ 11. I don't know if there's something else I'm, I meant to highlight here, but I think we'll, uh, we'll move on. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. You might have noticed shared pointer, unique pointer in a different color there. The reason is all the others are actually language features. That's just language features. There's a load of new library features as well, um, as, as well as the, the smart pointers. Again, many of these are, are pretty big in their own right. Um, some of them may be not so widely used today. The regex class, the random number generator, 
they've got a few limitations, but the rest of them are pretty fundamental. All came in in C++11. The other thing that came in with C++11 was non-technical, was a reaction to what had happened before. We knew that we'd really got into trouble between C++ 98 and 11. It just took so long. But we've got to do something differently. So we switched from shipping a standard when we thought it was ready to shipping on a schedule. And we decided every few years, X years, we'd have a new standard. And after a bit of discussion, we thought we'd give three years a try. So the next one would be C++ 14. So we call this the train model. You know, the trains always come on time. Whoever's on the platform, they get on and go. If you're not there, you have to wait for the next one. And that's what we decided to try with the C++ standardization model. And I think that is a good time, as Ms. Harold's saying, to, to stop for a break before we look at C++ 14. So thank you for listening so far. And we'll be back here at 8. Okay, thank you.